Hi, I'm Tom Casabobian, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about this water-cooled Corvair engine. This motor is unique in many ways. Yes, it does have twin turbochargers like my Clean Air Corvair that I raced at Bonneville. And it also is designed to run on propane gas. But its uniqueness is much more because the cylinder assemblies are fabricated from individual steel stampings. And these are, along with the chromoly cylinder, furnace braced together in a furnace at 3,000 degrees using a real thin copper foil tape to form a one-piece assembly. This means there's no gasket to blow out and the valve seats can't uh, fall out or even the valve guides can't fall out either. Now you might ask, why would you want to convert an air-cooled Corvair to a water-cooled? Well, it has to do with the fact that it's very difficult to increase the cooling capacity of an air-cooled motor. And I've had some experience with that because I've been able to triple uh, the horsepower output easily uh, with a Corvair engine using a turbocharger, but it's much more difficult to increase the cooling capacity. This engine was designed and built by Lloyd Taylor in the late 1970s while he was working as a consultant for Smith Brothers Pushrods in West Covina, California. For many decades, Lloyd has used copper furnace brazing technology to design lightweight, highly efficient engines such as the original Crosley engine and now this Corvair motor. Furnace brazing was first developed in the early 1900s. At that time, Mercedes-Benz started using this technology on their racing engines because it required less tooling and was considerably lighter than cast iron motors. However, Lloyd was the first to use furnace bracing technology on a production automobile. Let's take a closer look at this motor. Okay, so now we have an opportunity to take a little closer look. Uh, uh, it is dual turbos. These are the uh, early model, the model B flow, uh, two of those. Uh, this is the exhaust and intake uh, system. I use the plenums here on the intake and I try to use the very short runners. Uh, actually, because both the intake and exhaust ports are on the same side of the, of the cylinder head or the cylinder, I can uh, come make a very short run. Uh, three into one is the ideal way to do the, uh, the turbos uh, on the exhaust flow. The way this engine is set up, it's actually two three cylinder engines connected together at the crankshaft. Now here's a, here's a close up of the cylinder. I've got a little sign on there and it explains that there's no gasket needed. Uh, we'll go around here. Now here's the, uh, the, the vibration dampener or the damper pulley. It's on there but it's not used for anything other than dampening uh, crankshaft uh, vibrations. Uh, here's the other side. Again, uh, these, uh, these exhaust housings are slightly smaller or lower A over R ratio than the standard B model. And here in the back is where the wastegate uh, would be mounted that, uh, that uh, regulates the boost pressure on the engine. Now let's see if I can rotate this around a little bit and get a closer look at these uh, cylinder houses, at these exhaust and intake ports. As you can see, they're, they're very close together on the same side, and this enables, uh, the, especially on the intake side, you want a very short runner, and you need the plenums there to provide a reservoir of air fuel mixture uh, for the engine. Uh, here is the uh, water pump. Now, this Lloyd used the same water pump that he designed for the uh, Crosley engine. Crosley engine was only 44 cubic inches. Uh, this little pump seemed to work okay when I was bench testing. I had a radiator mounted right next to the engine. However, when I installed the engine in the race car uh, with a radiator all the way to the front, this pump wasn't able to uh, operate. It didn't move the water. I needed a booster pump and in those days they didn't have uh, hot water pumps with high capacity uh, that were 12 volt. So uh, I abandoned the project. I thought I would pick it up again in the future, but uh, that never happened. So uh, we're going to take a closer look. Uh, this is number two cylinder, and uh, we'll see what it looks like with all the uh, 
uh, manifolding and exhaust uh, stuff removed and we can see a little better what this cylinder looks like. Okay, this is a photograph of number two cylinder uh, just to show how it looks like when it's installed on the engine up close. Uh, you can see it's very clean, very simple looking. Those, uh, in, the intake and exhaust ports are very clean. Uh, you'd have to spend a lot of money on machine work uh, in a cast engine to get that kind of uh, finish on your porting. Uh, now it, it bolts at the bottom so that you don't have these long cylinder studs that are uh, get in the way of everything and fail under uh, adverse conditions. Uh, normally what happens is the, the because the aluminum expands at a greater rate than the steel studs, the pressure on the steel studs gets higher and higher as the engine temperature goes up. And to the, the final failure is either the stud will just pop out of the crankcase or the stud will fail by stretching or, or uh, uh, being uh, losing its strength. Now here's a here's a, an example of the of the Chevrolet method. They used a, a heat treated stud that functioned as a spring. Well, uh, when it's overheated, uh, as in this case right here, you can see where it's necked down and the stud is stretched. So the the, the, the cylinder head studs is a problem on all air cooled engines. Uh, Porsche has a, uh, a requirement that every time the cylinder head is removed, you have to replace the studs. And I heard that the stud, a set of studs could cost as much as $800. Uh, even with Lycoming and Continental, these uh, engines that are used in general aviation, they have a, a cast iron cylinder and a, a aluminum cylinder head, and they are they are tied together as a single assembly, except it's a mechanical connection, and uh, if the engine is uh, overheated or over a period of time, that uh, mechanical connection can fail, and you have what they call cylinder separation. So it's it's a uh, it's a problem uh, for all aluminum engines uh, that, that that use steel studs for uh, for holding the cylinder heads down. Now, the only cylinder. Uh, assembly that I'm aware of that was aluminum that was successful was uh, the Offenhauser. Uh, it was a completely one piece aluminum design uh, and uh, they had uh, ex excellent results obviously at uh, Indianapolis. Well this is an even superior design because the parts that normally have to be pressed into aluminum assembly are brazed in place. So the valve guides, valve seats and all these critical items uh, they're not going anywhere. So uh, this this is really a, uh, a nice way to, to build an engine. Now this is what happens when a cylinder stud fails due to overheating. This occurred on a record run at Bonneville in 1974. Less than an hour earlier I had completed my first run with an average speed of 175 miles an hour. However, the starter had held me up at the starting line with the engine running for several minutes. So when I started the run, the cylinder head temperature was already over 300 degrees. During the run, the temperature kept increasing. When it reached 550 degrees, I backed off in order to save the engine. Even at reduced power, I was still timed at 176 miles an hour at the end of the third mile. On the return run, the cylinder head temperature was just over 400 degrees, so I increased the boost to 25 pounds per square inch. The tack was indicating a speed of 180 miles an hour as I entered the time mile, but then suddenly there was a loss of power. The failure you see here was caused by a blown cylinder head gasket. The left turbo shut down because the remaining two cylinders on that side could not drive the turbine. In order to salvage the record attempt, I went full throttle on the remaining three cylinders on the right side. Running 30 PSI on half an engine and holes in number two cylinder getting bigger and bigger, I still averaged 171 miles an hour for the run and established a new two-way record of 173 miles per hour. If my engine had been equipped with Lloyd Taylor cylinders, it would have been a 180 mile an hour record for sure. 
one of the main advantages of a uh, furnace brazed uh, assembly is that you're able to make the components out of steel which is stronger than aluminum and so you end up with these combustion chambers made out of eighth inch steel plate that is formed into a combustion chamber. These valve are just dummies that are in place to demonstrate uh, their uh, their position in the combustion chamber. Of course, the spark plug is here in the middle. But because these are, this is an eighth inch steel plate, it's very strong, but it's uniform in its thickness throughout. So this area around the valves, around the spark plug, around the perimeter is all cooled by water. And uh, this doesn't happen in a casting. Uh, there's areas like in between the valves here where, where the, the, the casting is, is uh, very thick. And uh, sometimes on the perimeter, the same way, the casting uh, is very thick. And these become hot spots. And these hot spots cause serious problems. Uh, they cause uh, pre-ignition, uh, detonation, uh, burn pistons, all sorts of problems. So uh, that's, that's eliminated with this type of cylinder design. And, uh, and actually, with this type of combustion chamber, you can raise the compression ratio uh, and still uh, use standard uh, uh, inexpensive fuels because uh, uh, of the cooling capacity and the uh, overall efficiency of the process. We're going to take a, a, a look at uh, Lloyd Taylor's career and some of the things that he's done over the years. So uh, here we go. When I first met Lloyd Taylor, he was testing this motor on his homemade dynamometer. At that time, the motor was normally aspirated using dual Stromberg uh, variable Venturi carburetor, similar to the SU carburetor. Uh, I watched the I watched him test the engine on his dynamometer, and uh, it produced 200 horsepower at 7,000 RPM. Some people might ask, why change an air-cooled motor to a water-cooled design? Well, actually, the primary reason I bought my first Corvair in 1961 was because it was air-cooled. That was something that uh, I appreciated and was interested in. However, during the last 63 years that I've been driving and racing Corvairs, the most frequent failure has been the result of overheating. Lloyd built a second motor using the early model uh, engine, 145 cubic inches, and he used a single two-barrel carburetor, I think it was a Stromberg. Uh, Lloyd installed this engine in a 1966 Corvair with the radiator mounted in the uh, engine compartment. I drove this car and it performed very well, it, it, more so at higher RPMs. Uh, after completing this second engine, Lloyd went on to other projects. When uh, Hank Smith, one of the owners of Smith Brothers Pushrod, asked me if I'd be interested in taking Lloyd's first engine, I eagerly accepted it. Since I had built a dual turbocharged engine for the propane-powered Clean Air Corvair that I raced at Bonneville in 1974, I figured this engine would make an ideal basis for another dual turbo project. I built the intake and exhaust manifolds with turbos mounted on top of the engine. Because both intake and exhaust ports are on the same side of the cylinder, I was able to design a very compact manifold system. With a crossflow design that the Corvair and most other pushrod engines use, the exhaust and intake runners to the turbos are much longer. Everything worked fine during bench testing, including the cooling system with the radiator mounted next to the motor. However, when I installed the engine in the Bonneville race car, the front-mounted radiator proved to be too far away from the little water pump that Lloyd had originally designed for the Crosley automobile. I needed some sort of a booster pump to circulate the coolant. But at that time, there weren't any high-volume 12-volt hot water pumps available, as there are today. So I had to abandon the project and return the propane carburation system to the clean air carburetor that I raced at Bonneville in 1974 and is now on display in the Corvair Museum.